Hello, everybody. It's Ken Davenport here. Welcome back. It is Tuesday night. You know what that means. We are live with another episode of the Producers Perspective Live. Tonight, Tony Award winner for Red, three-time Academy Award nominee of films like The Gladiator and The Aviator, and new Tony nominee for his book, To Moulin Rouge. We're live with writer John Logan in just a moment. Hit that theme song, Mary. We're getting the band back together, getting the boys who rock to rock again. Some punks from the suburbs Let the sky with too much reverb Getting the band back together It's that shot of me with black hair that really gets me every time I watch that thing going, who is that guy? I don't, I don't even recognize him. But how did anyone not know I dyed my hair? I mean, it was so black. Anyway, it's not black anymore. We are live tonight. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Live. Very exciting guest tonight, John Logan, who I have not met. Another one of these uh, fantastic moments for me, anyway, uh, where I get to meet someone who I've admired for so many years, uh, and I get to meet him for the first time tonight. Hello, Alan Greenstein. Welcome back to the show as I'm reading some of these comments now as they're coming in. Good to see you here again. How's everybody doing tonight? Everyone have a good week? Everyone have a good week? Good, good, good. Any other comments? Come on, guys. Here we go. Wake up, everybody. Turn off the Netflix. Let's go. Drew, where are you, Drew? Drew, if you're not here, I may just shut this whole thing down right now. That's it. Right now. John's going to be very upset with you. Anyway, uh, welcome back to it. For those of you who are watching on replay, I know a bunch of you watch on replay. Please uh, do catch. Oh, there's Drew. And look, he comes through. One of his favorite screenwriters. So thrilling. We knew. You see that? You can always count on Drew to be here uh, and to have a great comment like that. Thanks for that. Uh, yes, watch those replays. Episode 7. This is episode 77. Yes, episode 77. Two sevens. Uh, there, everyone's waking up now. There must have been a little internet lag. That's it, right? It wasn't your fault. Uh, so welcome back. Thanks again for watching a replay. I know a lot of you do. Go, go back and watch some of those. Again, it's like a time capsule. And you can also watch my roots grow. They just grow as the, as the uh, uh, episodes go on and on. If you go back and watch some of those early ones. Uh, please, uh, people like Drew, if you've got questions for John, don't hesitate to throw them into the chat here. Uh, I may bring them up on the screen, or if we can figure it all out, it's only been 77 episodes, we still really haven't figured this out, but we will give it a shot. If we can figure it out, we may bring you in live for a question. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, there it is. Ask your question in the chat. We may bring you on live. Very conditional statement there from Mary Dina. We may bring you on because we may figure out how to do it because you may check your Facebook messengers, and most people don't while they're watching this stuff. Anyway. Uh, we're having some fun tonight. Don't forget, uh, last week's episode, Katori Hall, uh, amazing stuff from another incredible writer, Katori Hall, last week. Go check that out. Uh, next week, actor Cheyenne Jackson, actor Cheyenne Jackson, star of uh, one of the first shows that I produced when it was at Nymph. He actually didn't make it to Off-Broadway because he got cast in All Shook Up. Uh, film actor, Broadway actor, a very good-looking young man. Uh, and we'll have him on next week. So be here for that next week. Don't forget about the Actors Fund, everybody, as Pelosi and McConnell and all the politicians still argue, it doesn't matter which side on your aisle, trying to figure out the stimulus bill. People are hurting right now, and people are without a gig, uh, and people are without a lot of things. So do your part, help out if you can. Uh, don't forget, we have that fun little uh, tip here on StreamYard where you can throw stars at us if you like us. Throw stars, it all goes to the Actors Fund, so don't uh, hesitate to hit me with a star. Uh, some news this week on the Broadway world. We had some very sad uh, news. Doreen Montalvo, uh, star of Mrs. Doubtfire, as well as in the original company of On Your Feet and in, in The Heights, uh, passed away very suddenly this week. So our hearts go out to her entire family and friends and so many people in the Broadway community. I didn't have uh, the benefit of working with Doreen, but I've heard from so many people said, did you know Doreen? And I say, no, and she, she was the most amazing woman. So for all those people that knew her, I'm so sorry for your loss. 
uh, and uh, we're thinking about her tonight. Uh, I just was scrolling through my Instagram as I want to do because I get a little nervous before these things start. So I, you know, scroll. Uh, and Hal Lufting, producer Hal Lufting, who is a friend, uh, he announced just on his Instagram, I haven't even seen it on playbill.com. So we have an exclusive for you, sort of, unless you check his social media account. Uh, that's pretty not exclusive. But he just announced that uh, American Utopia, the David Byrne piece, is coming back to Broadway in September of 21. How exciting, an announcement for a Broadway show, September of 21. It is a little far away, but we'll take the bright spots where we can get them. I love Hal's determination for getting this back on the boards. Uh, so cross our fingers and all will go according to plan. We will see it in September of 2021. Last week, we had some big Broadway news last week. The Tony nominations were announced. And I have to give it to that Tony Award committee for making this happen. Couldn't have been easy to figure all this out. And I think they're still figuring it out. But it couldn't have been easy, but they did it. And just, again, another bright spot and a side of normalcy that uh, the Tony Awards are going to happen, which is a perfect segue to our next guest because he was a nominee. He won one already. Uh, but he is a nominee for his book for Moulin Rouge. Please welcome to the live stream, Mr. John Logan. Welcome, John. Hi, Ken. Good to be here. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Believe me, we've ne we've never met. See, this we've is never a met. It's shocking. Yes, See, it's this, is what, this is what happens because I live in Los Angeles, so like there's so many people in theater community I have yet to meet, but now I've met you. That takes nice. a pandemic to bring us together. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, so I have a lot of questions for you, but uh, first, let's just uh, ask you something that uh, I ask uh, most of my guests, which is, where were you when the virus hit the fan? Like, what were you doing when it was like, oh, oh shit, this is different. Something's happening. Yeah, I was, uh, I was in Los Angeles uh, working on the show that was supposed to be at Berkeley Rep this summer, oh, which yeah. is now at Berkeley Rep next summer, we're hoping. So I was deep in the middle of working on this, this show that was supposed to premiere in July in Berkeley. Alas. Well, Michael Mayer's directing that piece. That's right. Swept That's away. Right. The Avid Brothers. That's yep. right. That's right. And what, what did you know right away? Like, what was your first inkling that something was coming that was going to affect your life, the world? Well, when it when it started happening, I thought, in a way, I thought, well, look, you know, Mulan is up and running. That's doing great. I'm, I'm a writer. I'm going to be here writing anyway because I have a big movie to write, which is going to take the next five months anyway. And it was really Moulin Rouge when we started hearing about people who were falling ill and the way that the sort of the community and certainly the Moulin Rouge family really came together to sort of support each other and really try to be leaders in, in taking action. And Moulin Rouge closed down very early and was very proactive about uh, the process. And, th and that's, that's what I knew, you know, because all of us who worked on Moulin Rouge put so much into it. And it was our, you know, our, our, our sparkling diamond that we love so much, you know, that people had a chance to see it. And it was so sad to think that theater was going to be dark. And I was I'm back in New York for the first time since March right now and walking past the theater, you know, all the darkened theaters is, was, is, is heartbreaking, but one isn't defeated. You know, theater will come back. It came back after the plague of London, <laughs> you know, and somehow we got Hamlet out of that. So, so, you know, God knows Satine will be on that red velvet swing again. I love it. I love it. You're so right, though. I remember hearing that Moulin Rouge, that was like the first buzz, like Moulin Rouge, they are canceled their matinee. Uh, and I sometimes think if those producers hadn't been so smart and so wise and not canceled, what would have happened? It was such a sign of leadership and something we as producers and theater makers, we just never want to stop the show. But they did. Yeah. Knowing it was the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, look, it takes courage, as well you know, to be a good producer, because you have to be willing to take the hits from your creative team turning you and saying, what the hell are you doing, yeah. you know, to the whole company turning on you. But at the end of the day, a conservative, cautious approach to the health and welfare of your company and your audience has to be what you're most concerned about, you know, because there's always going to be another show and there's always going to be another creative team. But there's only this moment that you actually have to respond to. Michael Mayer has said that to me several times. What the hell are you doing, actually? In fact, he just left me a message. I think. Yeah, I, I look forward to saying it to you myself soon. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> uh, so tell, tell, you have this 
fascinating career in that you started in the theater and then got swept up into Hollywood and then back into the theater again. Uh, when did you first decide you wanted to write and was it plays first or was that always going to be the entry into the other world? No, oh, well, hell no. I, it, it was plays first, plays now and plays <laughs> always. You know, it's, I, you know, I still wake up every day as a little theater rat and as the kid who went to like Melbourne High School and did the shows and would come in on the weekends and go to Half Price and see all the shows. Um, so I started out just as a theater rat, desperately wanting to be in the theater and thinking that meant being an actor. Um, and it was only through experience, you know, learning that I did not have any of the tools to be an actor, but I somehow had the complete nature to be a writer, uh, that I wrote my first play when I was in college when I was 18. And that was 41 years ago. And since that day, I have never wanted to do anything but be a dramatist. And I fell into movies sort of later and kind of uh, in a haphazard way. Um, but it's been a great career going back and forth. Tell me about that haphazard way, how you fall into. Yeah, that. well, like I, like I fell into the deep end, let me tell you. It wasn't what I didn't like tiptoe in with a little indie film. What it was was I'd spent a long time writing plays in Chicago. And I lived in Chicago for 25 years. I still consider it my sort of spiritual theater home, you know, and it was theaters like Victory Gardens, Wisdom Bridge, and The Goodman that like nurtured me and gave me commissions, kept me alive. But, you know, it was a tough haul when you're really broke and starving and shelving books for a living every single day as you're writing play after play after play for storefront theater. <laughs> and I'd always desperately wanted to write a movie because I love movies. I grew up on movies. And I wanted to write a movie about pro football because if you live in Chicago and it's the 80s, it's the Bears. And it was so thrilling to be a part of a football world. And there hadn't been a football movie in for a million years. And there were like baseball movies every 10 seconds, you know? And like, I despise baseball because it just sick. It just goes around and around and around. But football is like dramatic action back and forth across the field. So I decided I wanted to write this movie about pro football, which I said was going to be about King Lear in the NFL. And so what I a Hollywood log line that is right there. I know, right? I this, is like, this is like I'd never written a movie before, so I'm like inventing the best log line. I'm I get very good log line. So I wrote this movie. I took I took a year off writing plays and I wrote this movie that was called Any Given Sunday. And um, my agent, you know, and he wasn't my real agent because I had no credit, so I was sort of a hip pocket client, a man named Brian Sibarel, who is my agent today and has been my only agent for 40 years, you know. Yes as a good one said okay let me see what i can do with this and a week later and this sounds apocryphal but it's really not a week later i was in adelaide australia working on a new play with this little local theater company that i loved and i got a call saying oliver stone read your script and he wants to make your movie and he's going to be calling you in 10 minutes <laughs> so 10 minutes later the phone rings it's oliver stone saying logan what is that irish i love your movie i gotta see in tokyo in three days what? Yeah, so like he was doing a junket for Nixon. So three days later, like goodbye storefront theater in Adelaide. I'm in <laughs> Tokyo meeting Oliver Stone and working on any given Sunday. And so like like when when like like emerging screenwriters say, like, tell me the story of your evolution as a screenwriter. I'm like, I didn't have one. I had the evolution as a playwright for 10 starving years in Chicago. I just went right into movies full force with that. So I mean, what an amazing story. And I'm just trying to imagine the little storefront theater's reaction when and you were like, I I kind of go. <laughs> yeah, like I went back. I, just, like, I, I went back, but I went back feeling pretty good about myself, yeah. I must say. <laughs> Tell me there was like a fussy artistic director who was like, how dare you? How yeah, dare you leave us now? For Hollywood land. <laughs> uh, amazing. So, well, and listen, you, you say you got swept up, but you had the, you just, took that into your own hands and just said, I'm going to write a movie. You had, yeah. If you hadn't sat down and done that, that never would have happened. What, how much of a difference was there when you started to write that first movie? Did you like, oh, I got to read books on screenwriting. I have to do all this stuff. Or did, how did you do yeah, it? Yeah, no. I mean, like, because remember, I'd spent 10 years as a playwright and studying drama and studying classic drama. Because I went to Northwestern and the curriculum there is all about classic drama. And you study Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides and Ibsen and Shakespeare, and Moliere and Chekhov. And so I was steeped in dramatic literature and I spent 10 years writing plays. 
And I wrote 14 plays in 10 years. And, you know, I worked with directors and actors and producers in front of house managers. So I knew what my job was as a dramatist before I stepped into writing movies. Mm -hmm. The actual sort of ledger domain of writing movies, you pick up in 10 minutes. You know, to me, I study the screenplay of Chinatown which is one of my favorite screenplays ever, the great Robert Towns screenplay. I said, oh, that's how you lay a screenplay out on the page. And then I just did my job, which is the same job I've always had. And I consider it to be one thing, which is write great scenes for actors. That's it. That's all I wake up in the morning to do. I'm not concerned with like immortal themes. I'm not concerned with my legacy as a dramatist. Every day I want to write up wake up and write great scenes that actors want to play because that's what excites me as an audience member. And you write, is that, as I wrote about it on my blog announcing this uh, live stream today, you've written such an unbelievable, diver, or unbelievable diverse set of material. I mean, your portfolio is everything from Red, right, to Any Given Sunday, to Gladiator, to Moulin Rouge, how do you go from something so small to something so big? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, for me, it's not how do I, it's the fact that I have to. Because the idea of doing the same story, telling the same story again, it's just anathema to me. So I'm always looking for a new story to tell. And, you know, I've always thought there, there are two kinds of, of playwrights. There's the Shakespearean model and the Chekhovian model. And the Jacobian playwrights, I greatly admire, you know, those ones who can take contemporary life and sort of break your heart with the crack of a teacup. That's not what I do. I'm drawn to the Shakespearean model, operatic, melodramatic, huge characters clashing in conflict. I've always been drawn to that. Um, so I'm always sort of attracted to different kinds of stories that allow me to write that way. I mean, in, in with a sort of grandiosity and i'm sure i'm sure way too grand for some people but it's you know that's just my that's my inkling to paint in those those sort of slashes of color uh because that's what excites me and that's sort of what i do so with the exception of writing the two bond films you know i've never wanted to do the same thing i always like exploring new worlds and and what we now call in hollywood world creation you know it, in my day, we just call it, you know, painting the picture or writing the scene, but it's world creation. But I do love that. I like I like going into Howard Hughes's world for The Aviator and saying, I want to know everything about aviation, about early movie making, about obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, or, or going to Red and saying, I need to understand who Mark Rothko was, what paint feels like, how Velasquez treated the color black as opposed to how Goya treated the color black, because all of that was important to Mark Rothko. You know, and so to, to be able to go into the bookishness of intense research and then just sort of let that go to create a new world is, is for me thrilling and keeps me excited to write every day. Because if I had to write the same thing over and over again or even subtle variations therein, I think that would be really challenging for me. So you took a question right out of my mouth. I was just going to ask you about your research process. So talk about uh, specifically, if you could, even Moulin Rouge or any any of the things you've done where that research period, what is it just you Googling lots of stuff? Are you visiting? Like what's that process like for you? Yeah, it it, it depends on what it is. For something for something enormous that requires huge research, it's it's you know total immersion. I mean, right now, you know, I'm writing a movie about uh, Michael Jackson, which is a which is sort of monumentally large subject. Never so, heard. Yeah, never heard of him, exactly. Singer, dancer of notes. <laughs> you know, so ah, I started I started with, with secondary source material, you know, which is all the biographies, all the articles, everything, just just assimilating it all. I have researchers who I hired to do certain things, to like ferret out things. But then you have to go beyond the secondary research to primary research where, you know, it means going to Neverland, going to the house he grew up in, going to Gary, Indiana, talking to his family members, doing interviews, you know, seeing primary documents, letters he's written, things like that, seeing different drafts of songs, hearing different demos of things. So you can you can begin to paint a full portrait of the man and the artist, you know, and that's and that's one example where I have access to just unbelievable resources and I'm just I'm just very hungry for it. It's like, you know like an octopus and the tentacles are just going everywhere because you don't know as a dramatist what's going to be the key, what's going to be the way in to the character or the story. Um, so that's one example. You know, Moulin Rouge, thankfully, 
Baz sort of did everything, you know, and and like his research, the, the research that he made available to us was was stupefying, truly <laughs> stupefying. But for me as a writer, what I did, you know, after my my sort of first conversations with Alex Timbers, is I went to the twentieth century Vo twentieth century Fox uh, script vault, and I read all the drafts of Baz and Craig Pierce's script to see how they develop the characters in the story. So I could just get deeper and deeper and deeper to things they tried that didn't work, things they tried that abandoned, things that they filmed and cut, just so I could understand how they built a text. And mm. from that, we then had to build the theatrical version of that text. I, I mean, I never knew such a script vault existed for these films. And now I'm dreaming, like, if only we had scripts vaults for Broadway musicals. Yeah, there should be. Well, I'm sure there is such a thing. I mean, don't yeah. you like you have you have drafts of all the shows you've produced. You have all oh, the different sure. drafts of things. Sure. Yeah, we should publish them. What do you think? Or there should be a resource where they're available yeah. to like scholars or other writers. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fast. I'd love to see yeah. like all the drafts of like Arthur Lawrence's Gypsy, yeah. West, like all that stuff would be. Amazing. Yeah. You talked a little bit about your um, Alex Timbers. Did you know Alex before Moulin Rouge? No, I admired his work, you know, immensely because because as a theater goer, I just love an immersive experience that from the second you walk in the door, there's a sense that you're being enveloped in a world that's being being artfully curated for you. And Alex just absolutely does that with everything he approaches. Uh, so I'd all I'd love here's I love bloody bloody Andrew Jackson. I just love I love his work. So when I first talked to him about it, I was I was super excited because I love the movie and I had very strong opinions, perhaps not surprisingly, being so 100% Irish as I am about how it, it might work on the stage. And Alex completely had the same opinions. We agreed absolutely 100% from our first telephone conversation about it. How much, speaking of script vaults and modifications along the way, well, first of all, how long did it take you to do your first draft? Yeah, it, it was. It took you know maybe about six months because the first draft also had to encompass the the initial song choices, and that was the true alchemy of Moulin Rouge, frankly. Because the way it worked is Alex and I spent a lot of time talking about the characters, uh, particularly Satine and how she functions in our stage play as opposed to how she might function in the movie. And I went away and sort of wrote an outline for like with no song spotted, just sort of here's a, a new outline of the narrative to follow. Christian, Ziedler, and Satine into this world and tell the story. Uh, and then the great, the great sort of alchemic event that happened was Alex Timbers, myself, and Justin Levine, our brilliant music supervisor, in a hotel room in New York for one weekend with a bunch of note cards. And we were not going to leave that room until we had spotted songs. So all of us brought in songs. Like, you know, there, for example, there's, there's the moment where Satine is alone in her dressing room and sings Firework. Well, we imagined it, you know, the, the note card said, Satine is alone, questioning her soul, she sings a song. And so what is that song gonna be? I brought in ideas, Alex brought in ideas, and Justin brought in a hundred ideas. And, and of any person I've ever met, Justin has the most encyclopedic knowledge of music, going from the most contemporary music to, you know, art songs from the 1870s in Vienna. And he could play them all instantly and make variations. So we, we auditioned the songs just for the three of us with Justin playing different versions of them uh, and we swapped things in and out. And after that weekend, I had all the note cards with all the song choices on them. And from that, we were able to sort of put together an initial sort of first draft of the show. And how much did it change from that first draft to <laughs> the final? <laughs> Where's all, where's that script vault, kid? Yeah, where's exactly. that script vault? You've got it right there. Just pull it out. I, I know. It, it changed a lot because you know we were we we made some choices early on that were too far from the spirit of the movie we discovered. So if we were trying, in a way, we were being sort of cultish, wanting to say we need to we need to fully make this our theatrical version of Moulin Rouge. So we sacrificed some things that were important. I think the original draft was much darker. You know, Christian came from a sort of a place of of sort of pain at the beginning of the the show, so he can find some sort of redemption with Satine, and we explored that through a lab, and it was evident that it wasn't right, it wasn't working because what is elemental about you know Baz Luhrmann's movie is is the Orpheus myth, 
it's Orpheus goes into the underworld to find love and tries to escape with her. You know, and Orpheus has to be an innocent. So we reshaped Christian in terms of both what he sings, how he sings it, how he's written, how it's played, to make him uh, an innocent and our eyes going into this sort of decadent, crazy dreamscape that is is the Moulin Rouge. That's that's one example. You know, and obviously when we were out of town in Boston, we threw stuff away. We tried songs in different positions. We did all the sort of tinkering in the engine you would you would normally do. do you, are you a fan of the preview process? Is it a stressful time for you? Do you love it? I I. Well, it's like, you know, people say to me, like, is, is there a lot of pressure, you know, writing a James Bond movie or, you know, you're, you're on, you're on the set at the Coliseum in Rome with a thousand extras. Do you feel pressure to come with the line? I would say, man, if you have lived through previews of a musical, nothing will ever make you nervous again <laughs> because you're there in real time while the show's failing. You know, and, and you're like, you can't walk away. You know, you have to sit there with an audience person like two seats away who hates what you're doing in real time. And then you have, what, six hours of rehearsal before the next show to try to address it. You know, it is, it is thrilling, as you know. It is harrowing, as you know. But it is also where shows finally are made, is in the, in the hellscape that is previous. Yeah, I, I I have been there, and I know of, of which you speak for sure. <laughs> because it's the it's the actually I wrote a, one of the first blogs I ever wrote was called "Where Creative Teams Earn Their Stripes," yeah. which is in that process. Because yep. this even the six hours you talk about for rehearsal is really you take out the breaks, you take about the time it takes to get people into hair and wigs, you take it out yeah. like changing scenery. You have an hour and a half. Yeah, and then and then you have the whole creative team going like, well, this hour and a half, we are going to use it to work on the book scenes, aren't we? And then poor Sonia Ty is like, I need choreography time, and Justin Levine's like, we need some music work, and poor Alex Timbers, like the ringmaster in the center, trying to sort of satisfy all that. Yeah, crazy. So, so is there a way to make that better? Or let me ask this a more specific question: What do you think? You you are so successful. In both on both sides of the coast or of the country, as I like to say, both coasts. What's something the theater can learn from the movie industry that we could we could that could better what we do? I think I think a sort of active communication, you know, because there, a movie set is is the most you are all jammed together, all making things, all in real time, uh, and all together, and too frequently in, in theater, at least musical theater, not straight theater as much, but in musical theater, there's a room here and a room here and a room here, and they sort of come together and there's some sort of creative collaboration, but then they go to their separate places again. Um, you know, I think theater could benefit from more of, you know, what Peter Brook would call, you know, the magic circle of sort of everyone being at the room at the same time. And, you know, as ever, I would say to a producer, Ken, Please. A long, a long rehearsal period helps, you know, a long rehearsal period helps and it's, I, it's expensive and there are unions involved, but the more time you have to like build and craft carefully a show, the better it'll be. It's so, it, and I'm so glad you say that because like I was just talking about a number of weeks on a rehearsal for a show. Like I have, I don't know when, but coming up at some point <laughs> and we're, you know, we're always like five weeks or six weeks. So we should try to get it to five. It's like, this is the time where you are baking the cake. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. take your time to get it right because actually you can't throw it out and make a new one. You're, it's right. a very expensive cake. So another week of rehearsal, which maybe it's a few hundred thousand dollars in a $20 million musical, right. if it's going to make it better, it's like add another week of rehearsal, everybody. I'm going to every yeah. – Michael Mayer just called actually saying, what, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? I want two extra weeks. Yeah. Uh, so congratulations on the on the Tony nomination. Thank you. Thank how did you. it how did it feel to get that nomination in a weird, different world and way? Uh, you know, it 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 felt it felt great and it felt significant. Um, not because the, I was nominated for a Tony, but because you know our show Moulin Rouge is about theater people trying to save their theater mm. and willing to fight for it. 
and to risk their lives for what they believe, that they believe this theater, this art, this communication is important. So in a way, all the Tony nominations that Moulin Rouge got really sort of made me remember that, that this community that I'm so proud to be a part of is supporting theater, not just my show, they're supporting every show. And um, the fact that, that our story of truth, beauty, freedom, and love, you know, was so well received is, 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 is lovely. And I love the company and I love my fellow creators. So I'm, I'm happy for everyone. Yeah, uh, it's fantastic. And we will certainly all be pulling for you. Although it doesn't, it doesn't look like we have to pull for Aaron to vate. I think he's got that one locked up. Looks like. I know. It's like, Aaron, you need some help with the speech. You know? <laughs> I've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, this is, um, you're such a fun guy. This has been a lot of fun, but there are a lot of people out there that this is a tough time, right? For a lot of people in a lot of ways and including a lot of theater people, as you just said, what, what piece of advice do you have for all those theater makers out there that are trying to stay creative, trying to keep going? Uh, what are you doing to make sure it's dark for even when you're, you're working, but it's even hard, I'm sure for you. How do you stay? Yeah, positive? It, it is hard. I mean, it's like, it's like, for me, it's it's find that thing that brings you joy in a simple way or in a big way. You, for me, it's hiking. You know, I go out and hike. I replenish my soul. I'm by myself for a little while, and everything seems a little less frightening when I get back. I know people who do yoga. I know people who take their dogs for a walk. You know, I know people who paint pictures. But what is that thing that is not your job? That's not acting or writing or directing or dancing that will allow you to find some sort of peace and perspective on this this very particular moment. I, I will. I can't agree with that anymore. And I'll. I'll and my golf handicap has never been lower. <laughs> That's it. That's my thing. It's like the one thing. And every time I get out there and hit a few balls in the beautiful green grass, yeah. uh, I feel a little bit better. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for sharing all this wisdom and positive spirit with us. I so appreciate Thanks. it. I look forward to being in a room with you very very soon. Hopefully. Me too, Ken. And good luck on Tony night. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care, John. Bye. John Logan, everybody. How much fun. Go back. And by the way, like it, those, all those movies that he's written, you should go back and watch them, then read Red. Uh, it's, it's incredible, the material. And by the way, I didn't even get to say this to him, but The Aviator, I quote The Aviator. I didn't get the fanboy all over the, about this. I quote The Aviator all the time. The first 15 minutes of that film are just genius in terms of setting up all the rest of it. Uh, when I talk to writers about their scripts and about exposition and about pathos and all these things, I often say you should watch The Aviator. You should watch The Aviator. So go watch The Aviator, uh, written by our guest tonight, John Logan. So thanks for that. Thanks for being here. A uh, few other things before we go. What are we going to talk about next week? Cheyenne Jackson. Don't forget Cheyenne Jackson next week. And don't forget, if you like conversations like this, digging in with A-lister Academy Award nominees about making theater and all that fancy stuff he was talking about, about Shakespeare and poetics and all those things, uh, you have to come to the Theater Makers Summit, which is coming up November 14th, 15th, and 16th. This is the conference that we throw every year, and this is our biggest and best yet. Go to theatermakersummit.com. Uh, we just threw that link in there. It is going to be an unbelievable event. We've got everyone, Chris Jackson, Tom Kitt, the head of the Broadway League, the head of Disney, like all these unbelievable people coming. And what are they going to talk about? Making theater in a new world making theater in a new world, a subject I know is on everybody's mind right now. So I urge you all to come. It's going to be a very, very special two, perhaps three days uh, if you come for that bonus day. A lot of surprises, a lot of fun, a lot of hope, a lot of inspiration, motivation, and education. So I hope to see all of you there. Uh, lastly, I will tell you, breaking news. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, the best lineup. I love it. Uh, breaking news. I'm going to tell you something right now. Episode 77, that's what this is. We are going to only have two more episodes of the live stream, two more. We're going to have our final live stream on November 10th, November 10th. We are going to have a live stream next week with Cheyenne Jackson, 
We are going to skip Tuesday, November 3rd, because there's some other stuff happening on that Tuesday. I think you all know what it is. And then we're going to do one final episode on the 10th, and that is going to be the end of the Producers Perspective Live for the moment. Uh, the reason is very simple. As you know, I'm concentrating a lot on producing more live stream events, uh, and I want to produce those for you. So I'm going to really dig into that. It's taking up a lot of time. It's taking up a lot of Mary's time. So uh, I need to free her up a little bit. Uh, but we'll get all teary-eyed uh, in a couple of weeks when we have our finale episode. They're going to have a lot of surprises, but that will be the final episode for the moment. Maybe we'll have a revival. In the meantime, go to the Theater Maker Summit if you want more of these conversations uh, and uh, hope you'll join us on November 14th and 15th and 16th. Now, lastly, something to make you smile. Something to make you smile. This is, speaking of voting, enough already. Broadway Get Out the Vote 2020 with Mario Lopez, everyone's favorite from Saved by the Bell. Who liked that Zach guy anyway? Mario Lopez and Daphne Ruben Vega, please enjoy Enough Already. Get out the vote, and here's why. When the rich get richer and the poor stay poor. When there's real injustice you cannot ignore. When the scale's unbalanced you can't take no more. Enough already, enough already. When there's people starving while some eat fine meals. When impoverished folks are facing grave ordeals. When the ones in charge are get to your appeals. Enough already, enough already. Time to change the game. Things can't remain the same. Who cares who? Can we fix it somehow? We, we need, need to, to fix, fix it right now. now. When the poor are feeling their needs left behind. When the wealthy upper class is far from kind. When the country isn't being colorblind. Enough already. already boat tuesday november 3rd we're getting the band back together